let's start out with what's your main motivation for seeking re-election to the LCSD1 Board of Trustees? Uh, over the course of the last four years that I've been on the board, we've been engaged in conversations that really relate to our strategic plan. So the strategic plan began with Dr. Brown, and we never really did complete the work, but during the last two years, we've been working on it longer, and then with Dr. Crespo currently, she really kind of uh, took, the ball, took the bull by the horns and decided that maybe this is, this is something that, that the community wants. And we as a board identified that that was, that was a high priority for us. So we got a tremendous amount of input from community partners, our, our staff, teachers, uh, custodians, uh, groundskeepers, everybody that works for the district. People in the community came and told us that there were really three prongs to our strategic plan. One is student readiness, the other is a safe environment, and the other is working with community partners. So I've always been of the opinion that if you have a goal, you really need to keep it in front of you all the time and not, not think about it once and then not, not maybe a month later you think about it again. That's not the way, that's not how you get to where you want to go. So for me, primary literacy is really the crucial issue. Primary literacy is, is a part of our uh, student readiness component of the strategic plan. Specifically for me, it's, it's, I, w I think it's really important that we get our students reading and doing math at grade level by the end of third grade because it really sets them up for success. And I'll have to be honest with you, we're a long way from that. And I think it's a really a sad commentary. I think our community wants that from us. And for me, I, I, keep, I see the Y top scores and I see some of the things that, that just aren't where they need to be. I understand Y top is just a snapshot in time, but it doesn't drive instruction. Uh, formative assessments within the, the classroom really do drive instruction. So I understand we can't put too much credence in that. But it does tell us something that we need to know, that we're not really where we need to be. So my goal, to get back to the first, your original question, was to keep doing the work. We've got a tremendous amount of work to do. We've been distracted for such a long time with these political narratives that have been coming up and causing us to you know, spend inordinate amounts of time doing, talking about issues that have no relationship to student achievement. So those are my, that's, that's why I'm running. Great. Thank you. If you are elected, how would you make sure you are considering the needs of all constituents? Yeah, Paulette, that's a, that's a tough one because, well, first of all, we make ourselves available to the public. And, you know, our, our email addresses and our telephone numbers are published. It's not hard to get a hold of us. We've had issues related to uh, input at board meetings. When I first came on the board, we only had one opportunity for input to the board. And because of my experience on city council, I said, well, you know, there are other ways to do this. We can do it twice. So now we have two opportunities for public input, one at the beginning of the meeting and one at the end of the meeting. One opportunity is really, really deals with uh, agenda items and the other opportunity is non-agenda items. You have to, they have to sign up in advance before they can speak. We in fact have a lawsuit that's, so I can't really go into too much detail, but we're currently being sued over that. So, but we, I think it's important to listen to, to constituents. I try to be a good listener. I don't always agree with the people that contact me and, but, but they need to know and I try to tell them that, you know, I'm, 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 I keep an open mind and I want to listen to what you have to say. It's hard to ensure that everybody has a seat at the table because we only have limited amounts of time. But at the same time, I think we need to be sensitive to the needs of our constituents and we need to be good listeners. So I try to do that. What do you think the relationship between the board and parents should be like? 
Well, I think it's a mutually supportive relationship. And so I think uh, we as board members uh, need to understand that parents have a vested interest in their child's education. And they can participate in the educational process with their child at varying levels. I have a good friend who's a single mom. She has two jobs. She doesn't have a lot of time to come to school and have conversations with people at the school. But she can call me during her lunch hour and share concerns with me, and I think that's great. So, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things that parents need the school and the school needs parents. And it's a, it's a symbiotic relationship, I think, that we try to foster and we try to give parents, parents a voice at the table. Uh, I think in many ways they control their own child's education to the degree that they choose to do that. You know, we, we can talk maybe at some point about library books and those kinds of things. But, you know, parents want to be involved in, in, at different levels. Some don't want to be involved at all. When I, was, when I taught special education, I had a lot of kids who, whose parents really had a bad experience when they were younger in school, so they don't want to come to school. You know, just stay away from me. I, they get nervous when they come to school. They never, you know, they just didn't have a good experience. It's not, it's not good for them. But we need to work with those folks too, and we need to, need to help. We need to understand that they love their kids, and they want the, what's best for them whether they're involved in their education or not, so. Yep. Okay. Next question. Uh, what should the rules of engagement be at school board meetings? Well, we need to be respectful. First of all, I think we all need to follow the rules. The school board follows rules, and I think parents need to follow rules. We have people that object to the process because and even some board members have said, well, you know, people should be able to stand up and, and you have public comment and you shouldn't have to sign up. You should be able to just say, I'm gonna speak and get up and talk, you know, to the degree that they want to speak. We've had, well, I've been called a communist and we've had people that had to be removed from the boardroom because they were out of control. So engaging in a respectful way I think just is good for everyone. I mean, we're, I mean, we learned this as kids. I think you just get farther with when, you, when you're respectful to other people. When you value, I think they need to, I think parents need to feel like their opinion is valued. And it's not just something we're gonna sit there, well, you know, we respond's over there sleeping during parent, you know, parent input. That doesn't give a very, I don't sleep at board meetings, but <laughs> anyway. So it just would not look good. But I think it needs to be, a res rules of engagement, I think, are just, it needs to be a respectful process. And they need to follow rules. Yeah. You talked about the change, let me just follow up to that, yeah. Rich. You, you talked about the change you brought to the board by providing these two different comment periods. Yeah. Do you feel that that's working well, and do you think that the registration in advance works well also, or does that need to be changed? Most people, I think, I, you know, I think two times in a, in a board meeting is just fine. And the reason that they have to sign up, I think, is you know our board chair and our board wants to at least control the process somewhat, so that we don't go you know into one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning with public comment, and we can kind of manage those individuals that want to speak. Some people don't like the idea of having to call in in advance. Most people don't have trouble at all with that, so I think it works pretty well. Next question is, do you think K-12 schools in Wyoming are adequately funded? And if not, how would you recommend the legislature address the issue? So the, at our board meeting last night, we joined the Wyoming Education Association in the lawsuit against the state. So Laramie County School District number one and two other school districts in the state, I believe there, there are just three right now, have joined with the Wyoming Education Association in suing the state. So I don't, you know, I would hope, I hope that it wouldn't come to that. I don't think anybody likes to sue anyone else, but personally I think 
that the legislature has totally abrogated their responsibility in this regard. Just to give you an example, they've, I think they allocated like $12 million for facilities this last biennium. Over the last 10 years, they've given our school district $800 more per teacher to, to uh, pay teachers. It's, it's, they're not funded adequately, and I think it's really unfortunate because I think we're going to end up in court over this. I hope, we, I hope it's not like Washakie or Campbell, um, but it could, you know, I think it's personally, I think it's going to end up in the Supreme Court. The legislature hires consultants and then they don't listen to them. The external cost adjustment, for example, has not been funded in several years. Their consultants told them they needed to at least fund the external cost adjustment so that you can account for inflation and those kinds of things. Uh, teacher salaries, you know, that we're, we're now not we used to be at the top of the market. We're kind of in the middle right now. That's not how you keep good people because there are people that pay better than that. And I'm not suggesting that money is everything, but it's, it's one of the things that keeps people in their jobs. And we've got some amazing folks in our school district. So to answer your question, Brian, there certainly, it certainly is not adequately funded and I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that, well, I don't know that I am. I don't think anything's going to, well, I know that the state went to the, asked, uh, tried to get the, the lawsuit dismissed in, I think it's uh, Judge Froelicher's court, uh, moved for dismissal because they, they said the Wyoming Educational Association doesn't have standing to bring the suit. So I, you know, I don't think the judge has ruled on that right now, but I can't imagine that he's going to dismiss it now that there are three school districts that have joined in the lawsuit. So, yeah. As a board member, what would be your budget priorities for the district? Okay, the most important thing is what happens in the classroom. So it's got to be what, what you need to teach students. You need a... a outstanding teacher, which I believe that most of our teachers are. You need to provide supplies. You need to provide a safe environment. So my budget priority certainly is that money has to be, you know, directed at the classroom. That's where all the important stuff takes place. So that's what I would do. Uh, you addressed this a little bit previously, but how do you feel about increasing teacher compensation? And if you think that it needs to be increased, how would you find the funds to do that? I don't know. <laughs> it would be, you know, we rely on the state for a huge portion of our funding. We've got, what, a $350 million general fund budget. And probably in excess of 80% of that is personnel salaries and benefits, which is not unusual for a large organization. That's pretty typical, I think. Uh, it wasn't too many years ago when we don't, for example, build buildings out of our general fund. Campbell County did that. Gillette built their high school, just wrote a check. <laughs> that, was, that was before recapture. <laughs> but, so, but anyway, so you know, teachers don't make enough money I think, and as I indicated before, money isn't everything, but it's one of the things that people need to feel appreciated. And if they, you know, if you want to raise a family and have all the things that, that people want, and you go to school for a long time and you learn all these things and you are a professional person and you're not paid like a professional person. But, you know, to expand on that a little bit, it's not just teachers. We have custodians, and we have food service people, and we have paraprofessionals who we did, just did a market study recently on the, on the pay that we have for our custodians, and we find that they're not anywhere near the market. So we're going to make some adjustments toward that. We couldn't do what we do without those folks. So it's, it's 
you know, it's money. I, don't, I, I wish I knew where the money would come from, Lindsay, but I don't know. If the state doesn't give it to, give it to us, I, I think there are some things that we could probably cut if we had to, but I don't think it's going to generate the kind of dollars that we would need to adequately pay teachers and support staff. Okay. Thanks. Next question. How much freedom should teachers have with regard to teaching the district's curriculum? Well, we have a curriculum that's pretty much, uh, we have a basket of goods that's set by the state. So there's, a, there, there's, there's flexibility within the curriculum for teachers to exercise, but there are parts of the curriculum that have to be taught. And it's really kind of a, it's a state mandate. There are, best, there are things that need to be taught. There are expectations that the district has as far as uh, literacy, math, science, those kinds of things. We have set curriculum, but I think the way the teacher, at least it was when I was in the classroom, was there's flexibility with regard to how you deliver that curriculum. And I think, and, and that's, where, that's where you see the art part of teaching. Teachers, you know, deliver curriculum in different ways. And they feel more comfortable in this way than they do the other way, whereas a lady, a, a teacher across the hall would deliver it in a different way. I had a teacher who worked for me when I was principal at Dildine who, <laughs> I don't know why this, I get emotional about this. She was absolutely incredible. You know, you, you watch these people, you know, you watch this lady uh, teach these kids, and it's just, it's just, uh, it's just hard to believe. They're so good, and they, and you know, and, and they, she has flexibility within the curriculum, but the curriculum that is required by the school district is delivered in the appropriate way. But she has a way of getting to kids. She has, she knows those kids, and so the flexibility really is in the delivery, in my opinion. So that's what I think. So, yeah. Rich, how do you feel about the teaching of racial discrimination as the part of U.S. history? Well, racial discrimination is part of our history. Uh, it's an ugly part of our history. But, you know, I think it should not be avoided just because it's uncomfortable. We teach history. Slavery is a part of our history. So I think it's important that our students know that and know what our history is. And one of the reasons why you study history is to avoid making those mistakes again. Not to make people feel bad. Nobody's trying to make anybody feel bad. You didn't do it, your ancestors did it, but now you can see the effect that it has. And so a lot of people would say, well, we just need to ignore that part of our history because it makes people feel bad. Well, it's too bad, isn't it? Because, you know, it's, it's, it's not anything that I'm proud of. You know, it's an, it's an ugly part of our history, but I think it needs to be taught because it's part of history. You just don't manipulate history. History is history. It's a fact, it occurred, and you, I think it's not there to be massaged and manipulated to make somebody else feel good or bad, either one. So that's, that's what I think. Do you support an opt-in or opt-out policy for kids checking out books from school libraries and why? So the Destiny program is available in our libraries. And it provides, in my opinion, all the flexibility. Well, let me back up a little bit. So the, the, the initial question is who needs to be the decision maker in this process? Am I going to make... Uh, decisions about who, uh, what books uh, Paulette's children read or Lindsay's children or anybody else's children. No, I'm not going to do that. It's none of my business. They're not going to make decisions about what my child reads either. It's not, it's not part of the deal. So the decision maker is with the parent. The parent is the decision maker. We have an opt-out policy currently. I think it works fine. There are people that criticize it. And they say, well, we need an opt-in policy. Well, actually, we have an opt-in policy. So we have a policy where a parent can work with the school librarian and curate a list of books. And they can go in and say, 
this is the list. These are the only books my child can check out. This list of 25, 30 books. They can't check out any other books. So to me, that's an opt-in policy. So the, the librarian will say, you bet, we can do that. So the parent is really in total control. They don't have to be aware of everything that's on the shelf. And we can't control what Jimmy shows Johnny in the library or what Johnny accesses on their cell phone. But the Destiny program and our incredibly talented librarians are happy to work with parents. Parent can go in and say, you know, I don't want my child to see anything that has, excuse me, sexually explicit language or anything like that. Librarian will say, okay. You put together a list of the books you want your child to read, and I'll make sure they can't, that child does not check out any other book. Or you can say, my child doesn't have any business being in a library. I don't want them to go in there. No books. They can do that too. So I think the process works really well. There are those that disagree. But. So, not to bring up flashbacks from last night's meeting, <laughs> uh, but what should the process be for changing policies in the school district, and do you agree or disagree with the current process? Well, the process now that you know we have a policy advisory committee, I sat on policy advisory committees for years and years and years, never worked really well. You know, some function better than others. Um, you have a finite group of people who are on the policy advisory committee, like 15 or 20 people on each committee. And really, those are the only people involved in the process. Unless you know, get public comment, and you solicit public comment, and there are members of the public that want to, to put input into that process. But you know, we just had a motion come before the board last night where we removed a lot of the superfluous language and we tried to tighten the process up a little bit. And we're going to do some additional work on what a good process would be in the absence of policy advisory committees because basically we're going probably looking at doing away with policy advisory committees. That was part of the discussion last night. I have no problem with that because I just didn't think they worked very well. And no other school district in the country uses policy advisory committees. We want to make sure that we bring as many people to the table as possible to have input in policy changes. We don't want anyone left out of that process. So right now, you know, last night our attorney went through line by line and talked about all of the public input that, they, that she received, that the district received on some of the policy changes. I've never seen that happen before. So, you know, people are being heard and I think that's really important because to change policy in the absence of public input, which includes staff and everybody else that might be interested in the process, I think it's really important to do that. So, um, there are some changes coming, it looks like. There, People, you know, it's, it's a good thing that, that everyone doesn't agree on everything on the school board. I get, tired some, I get tired of the acrimony sometimes, but I wouldn't want to be on the board if everybody felt the same way about everything. How boring would that be? You know, <laughs> I wouldn't be able to say, do you really believe that? Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, that's <laughs> so, <laughs> yep. Rich, I appreciate that answer. Can you follow up with, um, what do you think that would look like just from where you sit right now in terms of how to bring more voices to the table? And then, first of all, it starts with awareness of the changes being proposed. And part of what we've said is a lot of these things get brought up and yeah, there might be a legal notice in our newspaper, but if you don't read those or if you're not as well versed on the, how significant something might be, um, there may need to be other ways to get the word out. So how do you feel about that, whether that needs to be changed? We talked a little bit about that in our work session. And, and to me, the first thing that needs to happen is people need to be actively invited. 
they need to be, you know, and we, we talked about, you know, sometimes we, we put out this innocuous invitation or say, well, we've got policies on 45-day review. Nobody talks about it ever again. The people out in the public had forgotten about it a long time ago because they're working and they have their own lives. But periodically, we need to remind people that you have an opportunity to provide input. Please come and do that. Now, we can do that at every board meeting. We can do that on our website and invite people to come and, and participate. Because, but I think you know, there are a lot of really smart people out there who sometimes don't take the time or don't, have, don't believe they have the time to provide input to the school board on how, what they think the policy should look like. So for me, the, most, the critical thing is really actively invite them and repeatedly invite them so they don't forget. You know, we want to make sure that, you know, if you're either serious about wanting, my dad used to always say, if you, don't want to know the, if you don't want to know the answer, don't ask the question, you know? So we're going to ask the question and we're going to keep telling them or asking them, please provide input in this process. You have an opportunity to do that and hopefully they will, so we'll see. We've gotten to the end of our prepared questions. What oh. other issues would you like to bring discussed so far today? Oh, boy. Well, I heard someone this morning talk a little bit about critical race theory. Let me just say that, you know, I have some fundamental disagreements with some people on the board. Because it seems like they're always wanting to sneak in some, some fictionalized issue that's, you know, seeping its way into our school district. Critical race theory is one thing, you know, I, I don't know that I've ever seen a real good definition of it, but, you know, I know it's a kind of an esoteric position or issue that, or theory that's taught in colleges. Uh, we don't teach critical race theory in our school district. There are people that say, well, you know, I think it's seeping in on the fringes. Oh, come on, really? I don't, you do you really believe that? I don't say that in board meetings, but that's what I'm thinking. And that's why I can't sleep at night. When I can't. <laughs> but anyway, so, you know, people, I think there are people out there that really believe that, you know, it's critical race theory is seeping into our district. We teach history. We don't teach critical race theory. And there's a, there's a huge difference. So the thing that really bothers me is how much we've been distracted by all of these conspiracy theories that come from I don't know where. And we've got important work to do. We've got a strategic plan that, need, that has measurable goals and we need to be actively pursuing that. We had a, just a super outstanding update from our superintendent and her staff on where we are with regard to the strategic plan. And we're moving forward. It's really important work. We don't have time to talk about all this stuff. I don't know how much time we spent on masks and the Wyoming School Boards Association's political leanings and, you know, it's just, it's just frustrating. I'll get out, but it's not the most important thing. Some, some, I've heard some of our members say, well, we need to keep, keep politics out of the classroom, and well, that's true, but you also need to keep politics out of the boardroom. So, <laughs> sometimes that's hard, to, hard, to, hard for them, I don't know. I don't have all the answers, I don't pretend to know everything, but you know, I know probably one of the things that I bring to the table is just my 30 years of experience in public education. It's, it has served me well on the board. I try to be the best board member I can because it's a privilege to serve on this board. It is. Chris, just give us a rundown of your, your experience in the school. So you've been a special ed teacher, you've been the principal at Dildine. Tell yep. us a little bit about your history. Yeah, I first started teaching in Lander, Wyoming. So I did my student teaching in Lander and I did uh, student taught in, I have a double major, so I have special ed and uh, elementary education. So I began teaching in Lander, student taught in the second grade and special ed, got a job in the school that I student taught in as a special education teacher. I was a special ed resource room teacher. 
And so I did that for a while and uh, continued, uh, decided I wanted to continue my education, so moved to Laramie, where I worked on my doctorate and, and, and some advanced uh, education there. And I was a special education coordinator in Laramie, did that for a while, was hired subsequent to that as the assistant director of special ed under Janet Rulian in Cheyenne. So I worked at that for a while. I uh, ended up moving from that position to director of personnel. It was a director's position at that time, not an assistant superintendent position as it is now. They make a lot more money than I did. <laughs> so that's, it comes with the title. So anyway, I did that and then, you know, I was a, I was a director of personnel for about seven years and then I, then I applied for and was hired as principal of Dildine Elementary School. Probably the best job I ever had in my life. Because if you have a passion for kids, they're just wonderful. They are. I mean, they frustrate you and all this stuff, but I'll tell you what, they can, it was, it was a kick. Lindsay knows about this. She was one of my students. So, you know, it's uh, <laughs> just dates me, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm old, what can I say? But anyway, it's, it, was a, it was a great job, and, and I, never, I don't regret for a minute having done, having done that. So the kids, the experiences you have with kids, you think about them, and, you know, it's just, um, aside from kids that are living in their cars, we had a student who was living in their car, it just breaks your heart. When I, was, when I was taught in uh, Lander, I had a, had a boy who used to come down and, and work with me on an individual basis. He'd come to school. It gets cold in Lander. Came to school in the middle of winter. Tennis shoes, no socks. Kevin, what is the problem? So we took care of that. You know, his parent, and, and his, his grandfather was a physician in town. But he and his family were just poor as church mice. I made a home visit one time. He and his brothers were on the roof. They each had a two before, and they were trying to knock each other off the roof. It was, it was like, so where are your parents? Well, you know, I go inside and I talk to the parents. These parents loved their children. No question about it. They loved their kids. But boy, I tell you what, they were... You'd think they were unsupervised. They were not, un well, maybe they were, but it's, it's a good thing. You know, I don't know how he ever lived past sixth grade, honestly, and doing that kind of stuff. But anyway, education has been good to me. I, you know, I just, I'll never regret having gone into it, so. And Ruth, before I forget to ask, you're running for the Area 2 seat. Correct. Um, first time that the school board's been structured that way. Yeah. Why did you choose the Area 2 seat rather than the at-large seat? Well, I thought I'd have a better chance of winning. Just to be honest with you, there are quite a few people running at the at-large position. And at the time, there, was only, there were only two other people uh, running for Area 2. So I thought, well, maybe this is my best opportunity. So no particular reason, because, but I think, you know, even if I'm elected under Area 2, I represent the whole district. It's not just say, well, I'm going to focus on my constituents in the East Triad and not, not worry about the rest. You have, to, you have to serve the whole community. And so that part doesn't go away. So, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing, seeing who's, who's elected. It'll be an interesting, interesting election, so. Anyway. Any other questions? Rich, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. No, I appreciate the opportunity. Really do very much, so thanks again. <laughs>